Okay, welcome to the March 1st webinar. I believe it's a webinar of one form or another, and we're excited to have you here this evening. If you have any technical issues, feel free to drop us a line in the chat function. But a few of you have indicated that you can hear us, and that alone is a very good start. So for those of you that are following along with the notes that I have provided, let me just give a rough sketch I do, for these webinars, provide a glossary, but I kind of don't want to be the teacher that reads the glossary back at you. So there's a lot to pack in in this 45 to 60 minute discussion, but um, I'm not going to sort of assume that you need more information on what a term means unless you say that that glossary is inadequate or I'm using a term that is not on the glossary. For those of you that were secretly hoping that in the voting process the cap k would win um the cap k did not win although we'll get to some mild themes of capitalism when we discuss uh, bernie sanders and d um besides that in the opening section i think there's some information you already have about how to pose a question uh, and a promise from me that i will not take longer than a 9 p.m eastern conclusion Glossary is pretty extensive. A lot of it focuses on military terms or some weird impact phrases that you might not have heard before. But I'm going to begin under the header which says discussion starts here. And I'm going to begin by explaining hegemony and the way that teams often assume hegemony is bad. In some instances, I'll use the phrase negative. So in this instance, I'll assume that the negative is the team that's introducing hegemony bad, but obviously an affirmative could introduce this as an impact term to uh, this ad, um, or even from the onset in their 1AC. Okay, so the definition of hegemony is in the glossary and it has many, many synonyms. You'll hear it referred to as primacy, leadership, et cetera. Um, I'm going to outline the basic offensive arguments that teams tend to introduce when they say hegemony is bad. The first is in a broad sense called counterbalancing. In life, when anyone, forget about countries, rises to power, there is a tendency to counter that rise in power. If an entity in your school is exerting way too much influence, for better or worse, there is a tendency or a backlashy style response to exert counter influence so that that entity is not the sole uh, person or company or individual in charge. It's all the same in international security issues. And so a common argument is that the rise of US hegemony will cause counterbalancing efforts, usually on the part of Russia or China, but it certainly could be on the part of other entities. This tends to be part of a broader set of arguments that the negative makes, which says that hegemony is bad because of war with China, war with Russia, um, increased tension with terror entities, or that a rise in US hegemony would cause an increase in proliferation of nuclear material. A lot of people argue as a thesis point that the reason that the United States has never really gotten into it with North Korea in a physical war kind of manner is because North Korea has proliferated. And a negative could use this as an example to demonstrate how the rise of American primacy after the Cold War, because there used to be kind of two prime powers, now there's a consensus that there's one dominant military power has encouraged, not discouraged, countries to proliferate so that they don't experience items like what Libya experienced, where there was an invasion on Libyan soil, or what Iraq experienced, or even what recently Iran experienced. If all or any of those nations had nuclear weapons, that that would um, prevent them from being attacked. Yet if you look at proliferation from the perspective of other countries in Northeast Asia, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, it can have sort of negative impacts that would be easy for a team to defend. Other reasons, still kind of under offensive themes that could be defended, 
argue that hegemony causes economic decline. The United States is spending an awful lot of money on military weaponry and trying to stay prime. So primacy doesn't mean that your military is good. It means that it's significantly better than any potential adversary. That's not cheap. And a lot of people say that the rise of hegemony, especially in a military sense, has caused the United States to spend, overspend, have debt, um, have negative impacts for other social programs that that money could otherwise be invested in. The last argument is what I'll call the interventionism entanglement argument. If the United States is sort of in regional neighborhoods across the world, there is a sequence of events that could unfold where a conflict could emerge between two non-US countries, but a US soldier could accidentally get harmed or um, the United States could be more quick to get involved in that. And so one of the talking points that the negative or the hegemony bad team would make is that US hegemony is dangerous because it has a tendency to cause regional skirmishes to have a greater potential to escalate wildly out of control. Now, usually when I judge hegemony bad debates, a negative deploys some tricks that sort of allow them to not just say hegemony is bad, but to have an angle against the obvious forthcoming arguments as to why hegemony is good. And so here are some of the defensive negative tricks that tend to be on the table. One defensive negative trick tends to argue that US hegemony is not sustainable, that inevitably American hegemony will decline. There are potentially several reasons for this, but the most common one is economic and it jives with the economic argument I just made, which is not only that it's expensive and forces trade-offs to have the most primed military arsenal in the world, but that paying for that is not only a trade-off, but it is unsustainable. And um, a lot of people kind of, when they make this argument, go down the path of what a tremendous percentage of American debt is being used right now and is being financed by other countries, particularly China. So a common negative strategy is to say hegemony is bad for the economy and that the economy will inevitably sort of cause American hegemony to decline. So we should exit it before we spend all of our money and could have used our money towards better other items. Another common trick for the negative to use on hegemony bad is to argue that offshoring is good um, or offshore balancing is good. And this is sort of a word that means different things in different contexts. So offshoring means one thing when you talk about international trade and the economy, but offshore balancing means a different thing as referenced in the glossary. Uh, as it relates to military items. And so some people, and, and the president has taken this, the current president has taken this position as well, has argued that the US is out there too much. The United States is in Afghanistan and several other places. And that people will still be nervous and deterred by the United States' massive military power, even if we aren't forward deployed. So some negative teams argue that hegemony is bad they make the entanglement argument, and then they argue that hegemony is not good because the United States would still have nuclear weapons or could reassert themselves into a certain regional theater if they wanted to, and that the United States would sort of lose nothing by leaving because it would always have its current superiority to draw upon. Uh, and as an interesting current events twist, the president today said, that if things got worse in Afghanistan, because the president is envisioning departure from Afghanistan in the next 14 months, that the United States could always re-enter. And obviously some people worry about departing and coming back, et cetera, but that argument is part of the negative bag of tricks. The last argument is to say that multilateral systems or bipolar worlds would be more stable. There is like a huge body of literature that says that 
in the 1960s through the 1980s, when we lived in a Cold War with the Soviet, then Soviet Union, that there were fewer wars that were emerging because um, there were two powers that were at play and everyone was afraid that um, that conflict could escalate. And so they took sides and because there was always a potential of mutually assured destruction, it sort of discouraged conflict from breaking out. In the modern era, some people argue that the emergence of Russia, China, or both being on par with the United States might arguably create mass deterrence and make it less comfortable for the United States to be aggressive and therefore create more peace and that multipolar worlds would be safer. So now I'm transitioning into section number two, which is answering hegemony turns. Again, let me flag that if you have questions about anything that I've said, either direct them to Carly or to just throw them right into the chat function. I haven't seen any yet, but that's okay. So I wanna talk about what I believe to be the most strategic way to answer hegemony bad arguments. Number one on my list that I've never seen a great negative answer to is the argument that there is no willful restraint. Dan Shalman, who was in the finals of the NDT um, many moons ago, and Mike Horowitz, who won the NDT, co-wrote an article um, in their professional academic lives where they defended this position. They were answering the people in the literature who do argue that the United States should not be a hegemon and should pare back. And one of the arguments that they've made is that it would be very, very difficult for US military leaders to simply allow other countries to rise to power. That the idea that's being put forth by the hegemony bad authors is that magically we will just sort of like fiat a world in which the United States, China, Russia are all sort of equal in their military might. But the United States would not let that dynamic go down without a fight. So while it is true or maybe even inevitable that China or other countries will rise to power and potentially even rise to a level of might that is comparable to the United States, as soon as US military leaders realize that they have gone from a clear number one in terms of military superiority to a 1A or 1B, they'll fight. And that argument is a very nice setup for a transition war argument, which would allow the hegemony good or affirmative team to say, we'll never get to your envisioned alternative where we have this nice, peaceful Cold War 2.0, that it is naive to assume that just because the Cold War had some stability that we can get to the next Cold War without there being instability. Okay, it does seem like we have a questions. Okay, spell the names of the people. I, I will have Carly type um, the names of those people or at the end of this process, I will post their article um, on the same website because it's a pretty easy to find read. Okay, um, the second argument that I kind of have teased in answering hegemony turns is that I've judged a lot of debates and I judged a, a pretty prominent one recently when I was at Texas Austin, where uh, the affirmative was very strategic and was willing to argue that because hegemony decline was inevitable, that it took out a lot of the hegemony bad arguments. The negative in this situation needs to pair their arguments together very, very strategically. They should not be saying, for instance, that hegemony will inevitably collapse because the United States can afford it, and then saying, you know, any argument really other than the hegemony economy argument. Because as soon as you argue that United States hegemony will inevitably collapse, then it does create a complicating variable for saying, hey, BT dubs, American hegemony is bad because the affirmative can kind of easily kick their advantage accordingly. So the most savvy teams um, pair their arguments together in a manner that's consistent with what I flagged. They only say economic sustainability doesn't exist, hence hegemony is bad for the economy, we should exit it quickly. Or they say sort of multipolar rise is inevitable, we should do it now as opposed to later, things like that. 
So kind of, you know, just spend a little bit of time thinking about the way that your defensive arguments mesh together with your offensive ones. Lastly, I kind of point out a very simple truth that both sides need to kind of deal with. Most of your judges grew up in their hegemony debates, either as debaters or when they were judging, pre-Trump. But Trump is a very complicating variable as it relates to all of these arguments. Trump has run on a platform, which is an unusual platform, which is basically that the United States military should be super strong, but it should not be super engaged. And so that creates tensions that both sides can use. There's no doubt that the Trump administration is spending a lot of money, more than its predecessors, on military issues. At the same time, the Trump administration is, has gotten out of Syria, has announced that it intends to get out of Afghanistan. Forward deployment, which is sort of the term of being out there, is definitely on the decline with Trump. So it can mess around with affirmative solvency. It could mess around with uniqueness to some of the hegemony bad arguments because the United States has already exercised some moments of withdrawal and we haven't really seen a whole bunch of impacts. It's a very complicated variable to keep in mind. One thing that I will flag more when I get to section five is notice how the arguments that I've placed on the table, no willful restraint, transition war, um, the tension that exists are thematic. I am gonna flag this more later on, but it's a bad idea to have your sole response to hegemony bad be impact defense to proliferation and impact defense to China, et cetera. Those are nice bits of icing, but unless you have a structural approach which deals with all of the hegemony bad arguments together, as opposed to them in isolation, usually a smart negative will sort of outrun and gun you and manipulate the fact that they have the negative block. And a lot of times when these impact terms are extended, they're not extended with like two or three cards, but like 20. And so can, can you really give a 1AR where you're doing sort of checklist defense against every one of their impacts? Or is it wiser to give a 1AR where you're dealing with something that suggests the United States will never willfully restrain, so we'll never get to a world without U.S. hegemony? I'll pause there. Any questions other than the article? I answered all of them. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Now I'm transitioning to economy section, uh, economic growth bad, and what is frequently called DDEV. So first of all, um, DDEV is just a, like a debate term of art. It's not really a term of art that you would find too much outside of the debate bubble. And it usually refers to the green or environmental impacts to economic growth. Uh, if you look around, um, you know, you can kind of see the obvious examples of how a rise in a developed economy has caused negative impacts for the environment in all forms of the environment, be it obvious examples like the rise in just air pollutants or the rise that exists in like nuclear waste. Um, but then there are people that argue that it's a significant contributor to climate change, and sort of long-term green impacts. When I think of DDEV, I think of of that set of arguments first. But I do want to flag other arguments that the anti-economic growth people put on the table. They argue that when economic growth occurs, it makes war more, not less likely. There's some historical evidence which kind of goes both ways on that question. Um, they also argue something that I think could become like a big deal in the next few months. And if I was preparing for the NDCA or the TOC, I think I would do a little bit of work against the intersection of economic growth um, and disease. There's a lot of people that are now kind of arguing again that a global interlocked economy um, creates an increased potential spread of a variety of diseases, coronavirus being the one that's sort of most recently on the table, but through the years people have argued this about other diseases. Then there's other people that just argue variants of what I would describe as the capitalism K, so I kind of squeak that in anyways, and argue that massive economic growth um, tends to create famine or um, a series of winners of losers that sort of those that fare well within those markets tend to have massive profits, but it automatically comes at the expense of not everyone being able to fare well. 
which creates sort of ethics arguments that I've sometimes seen on the table for growth back. So what, what is the NAG arguing? Well, the NAG is arguing, as it suggests in the glossary, that we should sort of land on a notion of economics that is different than what the developed countries have. And we'll kind of talk about this more when we talk about how the affirmative should answer it, because there's a lot of different conceptions of what the economy should be. But the basic argument is that the biggest, most industrial economies in the world are pumping out too much pollution and don't have enough sharing of wealth in the world, and that's creating big problems. Some tricks that the negatives deploy. Well, first of all, the negatives are very, very deep on try or die arguments. They tend to argue that even if a decline in economic growth would be bad, uh, the planet is inevitably not going to survive the impact modules that I just sort of laundry listed off. Um, the other thing that the negative is, is really pretty good at when they're at their finest are epistemology arguments. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. And affirmatives, in my experience, do a pretty bad job of citing people who defend economic growth who are not like total corporatists. And so smart negatives can sort of look at the qualifications of some of the people who are talking and can say, everyone that you're citing who defends the economy is sort of someone that tends to be a huge beneficiary of the privileged developed world's economy. And that's a problem. And so you need to sort of point out where sources might be prone to that bias or be able to cite sources that are not. So on section four, I, I think I forgot to write the word answers, but in the header, it should be economic growth and DDEV answers. And I kind of want to talk about, again, thematic approaches to how to answer DDEV. You certainly can obviously go down the path of warming is not real um, or sort of an individual modular approach, but let's go into um, some thematic approaches. Before I do, I think Carly might be flagging me down with a question. No, she's not. Okay, great. All right. So the first obvious one is transition war. It's similar to no willful restraint, except it's the economic version of it. Think about the most corporate person, celebrity, et cetera, that you can think of. Think about the bad guy in every movie who's like super well off. People tend to not want to willfully give up their privilege, and they tend to want to push the mechanisms, be it trade, market share, et cetera, that allow their privilege to continue. So a lot of people argue that non-government elites would push for violence if any real alternative to development emerged. And while de-development could exist, there's no real way that your opponent in this round can sort of make everyone mass participate. And de-development sort of means very little if most of the world participates in it, but the wealthiest elites do not, because the wealthiest elites tend to have the largest consumption habits, et cetera. So what I would push really hard in cross-examination on is how do we get to a de-developed economy without a transition war and with buy-in from a large quantity of the wealthiest people on the planet. The second thing I would do as an affirmative is to try to cite examples of how economic growth can help not hurt the environment or be quote unquote sustainable. And I would cite specific forms of technology that either are about to be invented or have not been invented yet. And that's really the trick because if you look backwards at history, a lot of the technological developments that have allowed economic growth to occur have been very dirty. We couldn't have had assembly lines in the state of Michigan that built cars, which generated a lot of economic growth without some negative effect on the environment. But that was 100 years ago when that sort of came into um, its emergence. So with the next wave of economic growth, which you should be defending in this instance, come up with cleaner forms of energy? Would it create renewable energy? Would it create fusion energy, which is mass abundant and clean, um, but has not yet sort of gotten to a point where it can be harnessed? Could we sort of get to these forms of energy in any way other than economic growth? And the real trick to winning the sustainability debate is winning that unless there's a market incentive for people to invent 
new breakout forms of technology, we will never create clean technology. In theory, we could all go back to using windmills and live on communes, but unless everyone buys into that um, and is willing to consume a lot less, particularly in the developed world, then um, there is an argument that the affirmative can have that market incentives are the only way to create breakout forms of cheap, um, abundant forms of green energy. Uh, so I think the last thing I would do if I was affirmative in, in sort of some examples of how to answer DDEV is to push really hard at the history of whether or not mindset shifts will happen. Part of the argument that your opponent is making is that if there was a bad economic event, that there would be like full scale buy-in for living in these communes. Like at its finest, your opponent should be arguing that there will be buy-in from the elites of the world. And you wanna question that. In 2008, um, 2009, there was a major financial crisis in the United States, the epicenter of capitalism, and it hit you know, a whole bunch of people who were really, really, really well off. But it trickled to a whole bunch of people who maybe couldn't pay their mortgage, et cetera. And the financial crisis, um, kind of in all of your respective youths, was a big deal. It impacted a lot of people. But it didn't really cause a mindset shift. Um, we have seen over the last week, the largest single drop in the US stock market over any three day period. That's a pretty significant event that could cause people to shift their minds. And amidst that mindset shift, Bernie Sanders, who is the most socialist candidate that's credibly running for the Democratic nomination, lost his primary. So these are some weird little examples that you can draw upon that say there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between a downturn in the economy and people buying into sort of a new mode of development. And by the way, even if Bernie Sanders were to have gotten more votes or be elected, I don't know that he's endorsing communes. And so it's a very, very extreme transition to get buy-in to de-development. And there's a lot of historical examples where you can point to major shifts of economic downturn that have only caused people to want to make more money and stay more involved in the developed economy as opposed to less. So now let me transition to section 5.0, which is sort of impact turns that answer some, but not all of the advantages. So in my mind, I am thinking of an affirmative that runs an economy advantage or an hegemony advantage, but then runs other advantages that have unrelated themes. So the first um, obvious corollary is that you could flip the sides on this and it could be a negative that ran many impacts to a disad, one of which was economic or one of which was hegemony. The first strategy tip has already been foreshadowed, which is if you are in a really big debate and these impact turn debates are really, really big debates, you've got to gravitate towards thematic arguments and view your impact defense as secondary, as opposed to gravitating towards solely defensive arguments. Because if all you do is say, prolif is not bad and warming is not real, I just think that time is gonna catch up with you, especially if you're affirmative and you don't have the negative block to lean upon. Um, the best thesis arguments tend to be, we can't get to our opponent's alternative, and in trying to get there, there will be a transition war that will prevent us from ever getting there, we outweigh on time frame. All the hegemony bad arguments, all the DDEV arguments tend to be longer term than the transition war. By definition, the time frame of a transition war is faster than any offensive light at the end of your opponent's tunnel. That's a phrase you can jot down and should steal because if you win that there'll be a transition war, you don't just win another offensive argument. It also defeats your opponent's ability to have an alternative that would ever exist without hegemony or would ever exist without developed economies. So, you know, I think that that's a really important argument. The second tip I wanna give, I think is very, very, very important. And I watch the best college debaters mess this up all the time. I'll use an example. I judged a debate at the University of Texas Austin earlier this month, um, or I guess last month, and it, featured an affirmative that ran many, many impacts, 
one of which was hegemony. And the negative was super good and super invested in hegemony bad. In my opinion, the right approach in this debate is for the affirmative to extend or even shadow extend many, many modules and then to be very deep on the hegemony bad debate instead of the following approach, which is to have from the get-go, from like the QAC on, the affirmative just get involved in a hegemony good, bad debate. There's some downside to this strategy, which is that in the process of shadow covering, you might not have enough time to say everything that you'd like to say against the Gemini bad, but the time pressure is more likely to be inverted on your opponent, where your opponent has to give a Q&R where they're answering the space impact. They have to give a Q&R where they're answering the disease impact. They have to give a Q&R where they're answering the non-hegemony impacts. And that really makes it difficult for them to do all that they would like to do on hegemony bad. To go further down this strategic path, I'm not recommending that you fail to read your best, most thematic arguments against hegemony bad or DDEV, but I am recommending that in shadow covering, when the 2AR emerges, you then start to get rid of some of your arguments that are unrelated to hegemony um, in the 2AR. Treat it like you have conditional advantages. So if you kept four impact modules alive, maybe you would narrow to one or just two hegemony in the 2AR. But that pressure means that you can give a 2AR that's either solely about hegemony or combo about hegemony and the most undercovered of the external stuff, and your opponent never has that luxury. The only way that you can screw up approach, kind of taking this approach, is if you fail to answer that hegemony bad has some sort of like thesis that answers all of your advantages. As long as you think about that, you're usually in good shape. And I do think that the strategy is slightly underutilized. I flag it here because I'm about to move into spark and wipe out and explain why these arguments are categorized differently. To me, spark and wipe out, and you can look at the glossary if you're like, what does this even mean? To me, this is an entirely different category of impact term because it is not part of an affirmative advantage. Most of the time, this is being run in a situation where all of the affirmative advantages result in nuclear war and hence link to the Spark page, or all of the affirmative advantages um, result in extinction or mass death, and therefore link to what has been termed wipeout. And so that's sort of very, very different because it's a fundamental impact turn to everything that you've said. And you can't really with as much ease sort of deploy the shadow covered strategy that I just mentioned. So I do think we need to talk a little bit about Spark, okay? So first of all, Spark is a term of art, is like totally a debate concoction. And it could mean sparking a mindset shift in any context. I suppose one could say, for instance, that an economic decline could spark a shift to e-development, okay? Um, sorry, trapped into the chat room for a moment. All right, so, Usually, this comes up when um, the affirmative side is arguing that there will be a nuclear war that they avoid, and thesis style, the negative is saying it would be good if we had a nuclear war um, soon because uh, inevitable bad events will occur later, and we need to spark a mindset shift that will sort of change our approach to those bad events. And the two examples that I've seen that are most common is that a nuclear war now would not kill everyone, but a war later involving future more powerful weapons would. I've also seen this argument, which is that a nuclear war now would be survivable and good because a nuclear war now would change our mindset and make us more environmentally conscious, more conscious about population or a variety of other sort of world ending scenarios, space, et cetera. So, you know, the basic gist is a nuclear war would be a wake up call. Okay. Now, as I transition to the answer level of this, let me say a few things. Consider being pretty deeply involved in whether or not a nuclear war is survivable. 
And one thing that might be a framing device that you could steal and use for your judge or might be mentally sort of helpful for you to think about is don't view nuclear war as a security impact. View it as an environmental impact. No one argues that the initial explosion when a nuclear bomb detonates will cause everyone to die. That is not the argument. The argument that the affirmative would be making against Spark is that nuclear war is an environmental impact because in the medium term, it would have environmental consequences through nuclear winter theory or a variety of other things that we can discuss that would reshape the global environment and kill a lot more people than those that are in the immediate detonation zone, all right? So that is usually a helpful device to get judges to realize that you're not defending a one-time explosion is bad. You as an affirmative are defending a one-time explosion leads to ripple effects. Nuclear winter theory argues, and it's controversial, that uh, explosion of a modern nuclear weapon would be sufficient to either destroy the ozone layer or to radically change the atmosphere in a manner that would eventually cause everyone to die or a tremendous percentage of the earth to die from green related impacts. And there is a debate in the literature between prominent scholars that say a nuclear detonation would or would not cause that effect. And you kind of need to be ready to, on those studies to kind of be like, we should assume that a nuclear war sort of will kill a lot of people and is not survivable. The second argument that you can go down is sort of just an ethics argument, which is just sort of like this. If the negative can out-debate me and win that 20 people would survive in New Zealand because New Zealand is geographically remote and it would not be impacted in the same way by nuclear winter, that it's still really bad and it still really kills a lot of people. And you can never be a thousand percent sure that our not survivable arguments are wrong. What you can be 100% sure of is your opponent is willing to grant that we should kill a lot of people because what is coming down the pathway is worse. And then you want to question from like a fundamental perspective of ethics, whether or not we know that these future events that will be quote unquote worse are definitely going to happen and will definitely be worse. And so a very good thesis against Spark is just like, man, you're really breaking off a lot of eggs in order to make this perfect omelet. And in breaking off those eggs, that might be it, okay? And the omelet might not be that good. And that's sort of, I think, a framing device that one could utilize to kind of get there. The second argument you can make is that nuclear war would not generate this sort of mindset shift. And you can draw upon the broad human history. When you look at broad human history, when military conflicts escalate, it does not always cause everyone to snap into peacenik mode. And a lot of times when there's been serious military conflict, it has encouraged people to develop more aggressive postures, to develop more serious weaponry. If indeed nuclear war is survivable, you should not grant the thesis that those that survive the nuclear war will just be okay with what happened. They could either, North Korea style, need to develop a weapon so that they are not the objects of future aggression, or they could be um, directly tied to a whole bunch of people that died, and they could feel an extreme posture of anger or hostility that would encourage them to develop military superiority of their own. That is not a tough sell. The last argument to make is, is maybe the most simple historical one of all, which is to suggest that nuclear war has happened, that it is slightly offensive to suggest that it has not. Now, by admission, when atomic weaponry was dropped upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, it was not the kind of advanced weaponry that the affirmative would argue that in today's society could maybe cause a nuclear winter. But one thing that that extreme event did was not to cause a mindset shift where everyone was opposed to weapons. The dropping of a nuclear bomb, which was an act of U.S. primacy, or an atomic bomb, which was an act of U.S. primacy, did not encourage the Soviet Union to fail to develop weapons of its own. The Soviet Union realized that they were behind in a race for weaponry, 
and they developed weapons of their own, as did many other countries in the world. And so it's alluring, but not necessarily historically accurate to say that the dropping of like a breakthrough new weapon is something that's going to kind of change everyone's mindset. Question. So, yeah, the last question was, do we agree 100% that extinction is also a percent, or should they also argue that 99.9% is just for the Okay, so I could see a little bit of tension in the question. For those of you who didn't hear Carly talk, um, Carly read Zadow's question out loud to me but you can look at the question in the chat bar as well. So I think I would say both. I'm, I'm interested if Carly has a different take, but I think I would be like, we are going to defend that modern nuclear weaponry definitely would kill everyone and is significantly different than the weaponry that was used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but we will use Hiroshima and Nagasaki as examples of something that was completely unthinkable at the time. and that didn't cause a mindset shift. We will then argue the ethics of an even if proposition, which is if 99% or 95% of people die, that is a determinant, bad, unethical event. And we will just like argue black swan style that we can never be 100% sure that the future events that you are citing that will take place as the result of a nuclear war will be as good or as certain as you think. So. To reiterate, in reaction to, the Zap, to Zadao's question, yes, 100% extinction. No, that's not the only impact that matters. You, as a negative, don't access 100% extinction because you invariably live in a sort of longer, medium-term time frame world that can never exist in the realm of 100%. Is there a follow-up question? Or? No, I agree. I think if you beat the like mindset shift argument, then going for 99.9% .9 is still a really big impact. Yeah. It would be really bad to let it happen. Can they hear you I did unmute myself. Okay. Right. We have one more question, which was um, on the neg, can they defend future tech impacts? So to say, we should spark now to avoid future weapons that would cause 100% extinction, and then how should the app answer those? Right. Okay. okay. So, so uh, that evolution of future sort of tech is the difference between the atomic weaponry dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the weaponry that's been used in the now. So the affirmative needs to walk a really um, strategic line here. They need to say from a symbolic and psychological perspective, the weaponry dropped on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki should have been sufficient to create a mindset shift, which exists in the realm of the social and the psychological. But from a weaponry perspective, it's nowhere near modern weaponry and that we can't even know how massive modern weaponry really is in terms of its potential to cause nuclear weapons or nuclear winter. Consider that we used to have, before there was a comprehensive global agreement to not test nuclear weapons, we used to test nuclear weapons. We've stopped doing that, all right? There hasn't been a nuclear weapons test in decades, all right? And so, we don't even know the atmospheric ripple effect that could occur. We really don't know what that atmospheric effect is when you pair it with the fact that much of the ozone has been depleted and that wasn't the case in the 1940s. Or there have been a whole bunch of issues with carbon dioxide or methane released into the environment. So what ripple effect does it already have upon green inputs that are creating a problem now? Now, it is true that the negative can, and I think should, if they're running Spark, argue that the weapons of the future are worse than the weapons of today. And the affirmative should push back and be like, how can we know that? That is inherently indeterminate, insert black swans, all right? And the weapons of today are pretty amazing killing machines that have a lot of potential to cause nuclear weapons. There's a study by these, co-authored by two people named Robach and Toon, which argue that a nuclear weapon even the size of the weapons arsenal that's used in India and Pakistan is sufficient to cause a nuclear um, winter effect. Um, what should we say to future weapons? I think we should say that future weapons might actually have less, not more potential for extinction because future weapons might be more targeted and that they might be more smart in certain ways. So there's a whole argument which says that like nuclear weapons could go down a path that is designed to be like EMP style, electromagnetic pulse, where it could knock out 
an opponent's ability to respond to a nuclear attack, but could intentionally be designed to avoid the backlash that would be associated with mass civilian casualties, et cetera. So they need to prove that sort of a future weapon will actually be developed that will actually kill everyone. And you should question that and you should put all of it in the future is uncertain bucket. You're biting off a lot of um, eggs to make the omelet today. Okay. Before I move on to wipeout, anything more with Spark? Okay, I'll quickly close with the wipeout. So thesis level of wipeout is explained in the glossary. If you've never debated it before, wipeout is not a term of art that exists outside the debate bubble. And it just basically argues that extinction, not necessarily nuclear war, but that human terrestrial extinction, um, while tragic, would be good. And it argues kind of an extreme thesis that I'm not defending, all right, that um, doing it now is sort of important before humanity, um, terrestrial humanity, develops the ability to kill non-terrestrial life um, and that the death of those entities, aliens, et cetera, is not inevitable. So it's basically like, um, it's always inevitable that Earth and human life as we understand it will end. Um, it might be better if it ended before humanity at its worst created the worst of its technologies. I've seen a lot of different scenarios that people claim could be the technology that could go beyond killing humanity and could stretch into killing other entities. A lot of them involve things like physics experiments with superconducting super colliders, where chain reactions that could get out of control could occur. Um, but it could also be technology that relates to future weapons. Um, or just anything that we couldn't really harness or control on Earth. These are, again, just because I'm like a teacher at a public institution, I need to have like the asterisks associated with this that I'm explaining this to you for argument's sake and that I definitely do not think that um, it would be good for humanity to die. I think that most people that know me know that I, I like humanity. Um, so how would one sort of answer this level of argument, okay? Um, well, you, you probably shouldn't be afraid to link to this argument, okay? You shouldn't be afraid to say that, you know, we save an awful lot of lives. But you could fight back on the link by saying that your original 1AC scenarios defend um, most, but maybe not everyone dying, and a little like tag modification before the round go a long ways here. You still have a very significant impact if you argue that climate change or nuclear war would kill billions of people. But you could still then argue that humanity um, would exist after the affirmative was done, that those deaths would be unethical and tragic, but that humanity over the course of millions or billions of years could recreate itself and invent whatever bad technology your opponent is talking about. So you could push back on the link a little bit. Um, ways to kind of push back on the impact. Well, your savvy opponents that make this argument make this difficult, but you can push back on the various different forms of technology that they say will sort of kill alien life. So it's certainly not a given that a superconducting super collider, for instance, would create a chain reaction that would kill everything in a universal sense. Um, there have been superconducting super collider experiments that occur every day around the world that have not had that chain reaction. So there is just some like analytic logic that you can point to that suggests that this will sort of not get out of control or maybe more broadly, if you don't have cards against each of their different arguments because they're trying to kind of catch you without cards, you could indict doomsdayers and sort of say, look, a lot of these people are, are technophobes that sort of pretend that whenever there's technological development, the worst will emerge of it. Um, and that's not always the case. It is contingently the case in the use of the 1ACs, you know, nuclear weapons or fossil fuels or whatever, but it's not really always the case that every ounce of technology um, equals a pound of disaster. Um, so then I think the other obvious arguments that you could make that are more thesis level are, you know, does extraterrestrial life exist? And should we assume that anything that humanity can do would automatically kill that extraterrestrial life? I mean, that is 
a really big question mark. If extraterrestrial life is sort of out there, it almost certainly falls into the bucket of unknown and unpredictable. And it would be very difficult to say that a superconducting super collider experiment would have the same impact on every species that could exist potentially in the many worlds of the universe. Um, and so I think all of that sort of is there alien life, et cetera, is, is a really serious question mark. Um, a few questions that we got kind of before this started, and uh, I'll make sure to kind of answer them. They're from an individual user, um, and they sort of asked, uh, what are some tips on sort of convincing the judge that wipeout is an okay strategy? Okay, so I, I definitely think that it's, it's a strategy that is judge dependent. There's gonna be a certain set of judges that don't think that this is ethical. I didn't say that on the previous page, but like definitely you can make the ethics argument that was made on Spark against this. They, they don't kind of wanna buy off the short-term certainty of killing a lot of people for the sake of a, a indeterminate future good, which is a, like a good talking point. Um, so you gotta know your audience because there's some people that are just, you know, not gonna be kind of warm or open to this argument. If you do have to make this argument against sort of like someone that might be open to it, but might not, I think you need to talk kind of a, a lot in what I would describe as like Bostrom-esque mathematical terms. There's a professor um, whose last name is Bostrom that sort of talks about like the raw mathematical ethics of future thinking and how many lives sort of 10 to the 22nd style not only exist now, but will exist in the future and, and, and what it means kind of to be concerned with more than just humanity. And that sort of like mathematical and technological and scientific appeal is maybe sort of, in my opinion, um, the route to take. It is, a, it is a fact that the sun will at some point explode and that humanity has, you know, only a certain amount of time in order to make adjustments for that. So maybe you could sell people into kind of the premise that, you know, it's all gonna end. Um, but I definitely think you need to do a huge shell job that sort of gets at um, humanity or at least elite humanities sort of conduct and whether or not it is plausible that mistakes will be made that will kill um, all of humanity inevitably. Um, is there a way to run it like a disad? I think so. You can run it as an off-case position. Um, I don't know one of the questions that was asked if there were rounds on YouTube that kind of have these. I don't know about that. Um, so one of the questions that was posed about Spark is, are there some good answers to who lives? Um, let me talk about that a little bit. Um, a good ethics argument against a lot of these positions is that uh, it won't kill everyone, but it will desperately have a huge impact on those that lack socioeconomic privilege. Um, if you know, you've watched the OG Star Wars New Hope, like the whole Death Star blows up, but magically, you know, Darth Vader, who's the most privileged person, escapes on an escape pod. That's sort of like what you're arguing would happen in some of these things, that like all these people that don't have socioeconomic privilege, they sort of would not survive these cataclysmic events, but that super wealthy, uber wealthy Elon Musk finds a way to fly into space or whatever. Um, so if you have to answer that argument, um, I think that you need to kind of suggest that no one will survive um, or sort of say that Elon Musk's survival alone um, would not be sufficient to sort of make your whole argument inevitable. Um, I'll pause there and maybe answer some of these students' questions individually through back channel. You can always pause um, and back channel me or the debate account individual questions. Um, I want to see if there's any more questions for Carly. And if not, I want to wrap up in a moment and um, fulfill my promise to end by 9 p.m. Are there any additional questions? Okay. So thank each of you for your time. Uh, I'm loving where we're going with this experiment more broadly. And I'm asking each of you from a very selfless place to consider getting people who are involved or who are not yet involved in the activity, prospective novices, et cetera, interested in these webinars. There are a lot of students that go to schools where they don't have a lot of access to instruction. And 10 years ago, the way they got that instruction was through chats on the internet. And now we can kind of do the visual um, 
alternative to that. And I just think that if we want our activity to be sustainable and grow, a lot of us need to serve as ambassadors. And a lot of you have friends, relationships, peers, not only with people in your own school, but other schools that might just get encouraged to consider doing policy debate. And if you're like me and policy debate has been a transformative event for you, then you might want to sort of spread the word. And I think that these free webinars, which we will continue doing, um, are part of the way to get other people involved. If you have individual questions, pose them. I promise I will respond to some of the individual questions that we did receive that I didn't have a chance to answer. Thank you so much for your time. And um, we'll keep you alerted to when these occur in the future. Have a good evening.